Okay, if I can get your attention, we're going to go ahead and get started today. We're running a little late thanks to the tremendous crowd that we have. On behalf of the Northeast Missouri Rural Health Network, I would like to welcome you today. The network is a nonprofit organization based here in Kirksville with 27 member agencies consisting of all types of health care providers and medical educators. We offer both patient based program and member services throughout an 11 county service area. One of the goals of the network is to provide education to both providers and the community. Today we are pleased to have Ryan Barker with us. Ryan is the director of Health Policy at the Missouri Foundation for Health. He joined the, the foundation in 2002, assisted in the establishment and growth of the health policy area at the foundation, and in the last nine years, his research has focused on issues such as Missouri's Medicaid program, increasing health equity, and strategies to provide quality, affordable health coverage to all Missourians. The health policy area of the foundation works in four focus areas, research and education, grant making and contracts, advocacy capacity building, and community and government outreach. We will have a question and answer session immediately following the presentation. We will bring the microphone around to the audience, so raise your hands during that time if you have a question. Those who are viewing via the internet have a chat area there on your computers where you can uh, type questions in and we will then read them to Ryan. So with that, we'll let Ryan get started. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Glenna. Welcome, good afternoon. Um, this is an awesome turnout, thank you. Um, I think I heard a professor say that he told his class they had to come and he's taking attendance, so that may explain the turnout a little bit. Um, I mean, I know you all want to hear about the Affordable Care Act. So a little bit about the Missouri Foundation for Health. We are a nonprofit, prof private foundation. Most of what we do is grant making. We do grant making in a variety of different areas tobacco prevention, obesity, physical activity, primary care, mental health. There's probably about 12 different focus areas of the foundation. However, we do have a policy shop, a health policy shop. Very early on, our board of directors said, you know, we could give away all the money we have and it's just drop, a drop in the bucket when it comes to health care. Um, and they said, we really have to start addressing health care issues from a, from a systemic perspective. So, we do have a policy shop. We do not lobby, um, so we do not take a stand on any given piece of legislation. And the reason we're doing this is so actually right after the, the Affordable Care Act passed, we realized and we're paying attention to the media just like everybody else and there was a lot of misinformation out there. And we said, you know what, we have tried to establish ourselves as this neutral fact-based source of information. Maybe we should go out in the community and start talking about what is really in the Affordable Care Act and what does it mean. And so we decided to do it for the summer of 2010. Um, and yet here I am, the fall of 2012, 180 presentations later, um, we don't even, we just, at one presentation leads to about 10 more. Um, and so we just keep doing it uh, as long as people want us to. So we have, I'm gonna try my best to get everybody out on time because I know we have people that have to get back to work. So I am gonna spend about 50 minutes talking about 2,500 page law. Um, we're, I'm gonna talk really fast, no, I'm kidding. I am not gonna cover everything that is in this law. Um, I am gonna hit the highlights and spend some time specifically on some stuff that I think providers will be most interested in. Um, so with that, I'm gonna jump right in and I will, I'm gonna do my best to leave time for questions at the end. I will stick around if you don't get your questions answered. Um, I, there's another presentation tonight at 5.30. So if you wanna come back, um, it is a slightly different presentation this evening. So I wanted to start out this summer, the Supreme Court ruled on the Affordable Care Act and made a decision. So I want to just quickly touch on what was the court case that the Supreme Court was, was reviewing and what were the questions that they were answering. So there were four main questions that the Supreme Court review, reviewed. And the first one was, is it too soon to even hear this court case? So there's something called the Anti-Injunction Act. And what that means is if, if Congress passes a tax, you can't sue to overturn the tax until someone is actually penalized with that tax. So the Supreme Court had to decide, does the Anti-Injunction Act apply to the Affordable Care Act? And in a 5-4 opinion, the answer was no. And the reason that it was no, and this is gonna be really tricky as we go through this, the reason it was no was because 
In the legislation, in the Affordable Care Act, it calls it a penalty. So because it calls it a penalty, the Anti-Injunction Act does not apply. The second question, and the big question that everybody was sort of waiting to hear, because this is probably, this is, it's not probably, this is the most unpopular part of the Affordable Care Act. The individual mandate that says every American will have health insurance. Is this constitutionally, does Congress have the authority to do an individual mandate? And the, the administration, the federal administration that was arguing in support of the Affordable Care Act argued for three different parts of the Constitution to uphold the individual mandate. So the first thing they argued in our Constitution is the Commerce Clause, which says Congress has the authority to pass laws that have an impact on interstate commerce. If you've ever heard that interstate commerce clause, it's the Commerce Clause. And everybody expected that if it was going to get upheld, this would be what, what upheld it. But they actually answered no. They said the Commerce Clause does not apply. It's not constitutional under the Commerce Clause. The second argument was the Necessary and Proper Clause, which says Congress has the authority to pass laws that are necessary and proper in order to conduct the business that they want to conduct. Now, the Necessary and Proper Clause is very closely tied to the Interstate Commerce or the Commerce Clause. So when they said no to the first one, they said no to the second one. So at this point, if you were watching that day and you're a big policy geek like myself and my staff, we were sitting in the office and news reports started coming out that the individual mandate had been overturned. And the reason that happened was there were all these reporters in the Supreme Court hearing room and they started reading the handout and they didn't read far enough. As soon as they saw no and no, they were like, it's been overturned and they ran out of the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, people didn't read far enough because nobody expected this to get upheld under the, the third argument. In fact, the administration sort of threw in this last argument uh, sort of last minute and said, we're going we're gonna to try this, just throw it in as another argument. And it did get upheld, and it got upheld under this tax and spend clause that says Congress has the authority to institute taxes and spend those taxes as appropriate. Now, this was a 5-4 vote to uphold this. Now, I just said the reason the Anti-Injunction Act didn't apply was because the Affordable Care Act called it a penalty. And the Supreme Court then said it's constitutional because even though they call it a penalty, it's enforced by the IRS and it acts as if it's a tax. So this is threading a very small needle. Um, but they did it, and this is what the Supreme Court decided. The third question was, if they had said the individual mandate is unconstitutional and we're throwing that out, what do we do with the rest of the act? Do we keep it, do we throw parts of it out, or do we throw the whole thing out? Because they found the individual mandate constitutional, they didn't have to answer this question of severability. So the whole thing stood. Now, this is really important, and we're going to come back to it later in the presentation. This was a 5-4 also, and the minority opinion, so four of the Supreme Court justices, answered this question. And they didn't say individual mandate has to go, the rest of it's fine. They didn't say individual mandate has to go, and this stuff also has to go, but the rest. They threw out the entire law. So they said without the individual mandate, the whole thing has to go. And I will talk about why that minority opinion had a point. And it actually comes up under the fourth question, which was sort of the sleeper question because there's not a whole lot of people that are interested in Medicaid. But there was a, a the 26 states sued as part of the Supreme Court case around the Medicaid expansion. We'll talk about this a little later. Um, the Affordable Care Act mandated that states expand their Medicaid programs. And the state said, you know what, it is, that is too harsh because what it did was say, you will expand Medicaid, and if you don't, you lose all of your federal funding for Medicaid, for your existing Medicaid program. And the state said, whoa, 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 um, you can't do that. And the Supreme Court agreed with the states on this one. And they said, Medicaid expansion is constitutional, but you cannot force states to expand by penalizing them and it must be optional. So this it, it really was a, a, a victory for states' rights and state flexibility and state options. Um, but it causes a lot of issues, um, which ties back to why it's important that that minority opinion throughout the entire law. I, I threw this slide in. Um, this is a recent poll that came out, and I just thought it was interesting. So it may be a little hard to see, but the top 
there's consumers, physicians, and employers. And they polled them about health care and the Affordable Care Act. And first they asked, would you give our health care system, what grade would you give our health care system in the United States? And across the board, about a third of those groups gave our health care system an A or a B. And about two thirds gave it a C, D, or F. So everybody's pretty aligned when we think about the health care system and what their opinions are. Then it gets a little interesting. What, are the top, what is the top driver of health care costs? Employers and consumers both said hospital costs are the driver of health care costs. Interestingly, physicians said, no, it's consumer behavior. So sort of goes back to the personal responsibility, personal behavior, smoking, eating too much, not eating the right foods. Then we get to the views on the health care reform law, on the Affordable Care Act. What do people think? And interestingly, consumers are pretty split. So it's almost a third, a third, a third of good, the, the, the options were good start, wrong direction, or not, not sure, uncertain. And you can see it's about a third in each category for consumers. For doctors or for physicians, they're very split, but there's not a lot of undecideds. And then employers really don't like this law. Um, as you can see, about 60%. And there are a lot of new requirements and, and sort of the business community in general, and I'm generalizing, has been dragging its feet on thinking about and implementing this law. And so they're starting to panic that, okay, this got upheld. We actually may have to implement some of these new regulations and it's scaring them. So 60% do not like this law of employers pulled. We are not gonna cover all of these topics today, but these are topics in the Affordable Care Act that I can answer questions about. Um, and we will cover uh, quite a few of them as we go. What are some of the major themes? So what were they trying to do with the Affordable Care Act? They were not trying to do everything, although it may seem like it. Um, but the major things in the Affordable Care Act are trying to expand health insurance coverage. So right now we have, and the new census numbers just came out, there's about 47 million uninsured Americans. Currently there's about 310 million Americans, so that's almost one in six. Americans that don't have health insurance. Under the Affordable Care Act, if they hadn't made the Medicaid expansion state optional, about 32 million of those 47 million would have gained health insurance coverage. The, the remaining uninsured, about 10 million of them, the, the bulk of the remaining uninsured would be immigrants, um, mostly undocumented immigrants. Some, there are some restrictions on legal immigrants and, and health insurance and the way this works. So there was a big focus on getting more people health insurance. There were a lot of insurance regulations, and we'll talk about those, the way health insurance works in this country. There was an attempt to shift our health care system to focus more on prevention. So uh, probably all of you in this room have heard the terms morbidity and mortality. So mortality. We are probably the greatest healthcare system in the world when it comes to mortality. Mortality is keeping people alive. We are really good at keeping people alive. Morbidity is keeping people healthy. We're not as good at keeping people healthy in this country. We don't spend a lot of our healthcare dollars on prevention. And so this law really tries to shift the focus to primary care, keeping people healthy before they develop those chronic diseases, which as, as the physician said in that survey, consumer behavior is really tied to prevention and making the right choices. There are some new models of care trying to shift the way our healthcare system works and a focus on increasing quality. So um, this slide is, it, you think it looks funny now. I actually created it and it looked even worse and then I made my graphic designer do it and I, I think the green little unhappy guys look like the Mr. Yuck stickers for those of you old enough to remember. Um, so this, I, this, really the slide is about what is the major issue in our healthcare system when it comes to health insurance. So if you work for a large employer, you have this huge pool of employees and it's just like think about health, uh, think about like homeowner's insurance or auto insurance. The bigger the pool you have, the more you spread out the risk and so you're spreading out the costs. So health insurance works pretty well when we're talking about large employers. In Missouri, 96% of large employers with more than 100 employees offer health insurance, 96%. The issue is when we start talking about small employers. 
Small employers, if you only have 10 employees and you have three of them that have some form of chronic disease, your healthcare costs are gonna skyrocket. In Missouri, 43% of small businesses offer health insurance. 43 versus 96. So health insurance works, the model we have works pretty well for large employers, doesn't work for small employers. And then when you talk about individuals or family units trying to go out and purchase insurance themselves on the individual market, same thing. If you're young and healthy, don't have any pre-existing conditions, you can find pretty affordable insurance. As soon as you develop, as soon as you have any form of, any form of pre-existing condition, you are gonna be priced out of that individual market. So how does the Affordable Care Act try to address this idea of pooling, of making larger pools? So what the major way is the creation of these health insurance exchanges. Now unfortunately, there's some confusion. HIE, it means two different things. Uh, HIE is Health Inf Information Exchange and Health Insurance Exchange. So we're actually using HIX for the health insurance exchanges and HIE for health information exchanges. So what is an insurance exchange? What does that mean? If it's about pooling and creating bigger pools of people for health insurance, I like to think of it as a farmer's market because everybody knows what that is. You go into a farmer's market, there's different stalls. At each stall is a farmer selling his produce. Now, replace that farmer in your head with an insurance company. So there is an insurance company in every stall selling their produce. And you as the consumer of health insurance as a business or as an individual or family, go into that farmer's market and you get to shop for health insurance. Now this will be mostly online, but will also be an exchange where you can go in person and fill out forms and, and apply with paper. What is different about this exchange? Why is it important? Because everybody that goes into the exchange, they get pooled together in a giant pool. So they're spreading their, their health risks across a bigger pool of people. So initially, these exchanges have to be up and running January 1, 2014. So we're only about a year away. In fact, they start enrolling people in October of next year. The law says states can set up their own health insurance exchange, or if they choose not to, the federal government will come in and set one up for them. Now the federal government has done what I would say is, is a lot in terms of flexibility in trying to get states to do their own exchange. The feds don't really wanna run an exchange, um, but a lot of states are in the same place that Missouri is where our policymakers have been dragging their feet a little bit, waiting to see the decision of the Supreme Court, waiting to see November's election results. So we haven't taken any action um, on developing a health insurance exchange. So where we are right now is November 16th of this year, the state of Missouri has to, the, the administration, the governor's office, has to tell the federal government on November 16th, will we do a state-based exchange or will we do a federal exchange? Now the feds have come out and said that there's an in-between option called a federal partnership exchange and that that will be something where the feds will work with the state to create exchange together. At this point, we will not have a state-based exchange. It's just too late. Now, the interesting thing is that every November, a state can change its mind. So say this year, we don't have time to do a state-based. We say we're gonna do a partnership. Next November, we could say, you know what, we're gonna switch to a state-based exchange, but the legislature has to act and say, we want a state-based insurance exchange in Missouri. So initially, it's open to, to individuals and small businesses with less than 100 employees. Um, larger employers can use this exchange starting in 2017. Each insurance company, so each stall that you go to, creates four, there's four different type of plans that each insurance company offers to those that are entering this market. And they're called platinum, gold, silver, and bronze. Very creative. Um, the platinum plan will cover, and this is like insurance actuarial, 90% of your healthcare costs, and the consumer is responsible for 10%. A gold plan is 80-20, Silver is 70-30, bronze is 60-40. There is a catastrophic plan that only covers like major medical. Um, you have to be younger than 30 years old to purchase that catastrophic plan. And that's really meant for young people who, oh, I'm not sick, I'm, not, I'm healthy, I don't really wanna buy insurance, but now there's this individual mandate that says I have to. So I just want something in case something major happens. 
Some new rules in the exchange, there's something called guarantee issue and renewability, and this is getting back to the insurance reforms. So right now, if you go into the insurance market and try to shop for insurance for yourself, the insurance company can look at you. This actually just happened to one of my friends, 34 years old. He had a, a bulging disc five years ago that was taken care of, and it's not a problem anymore. But he was denied health insurance because of that pre-existing condition on the individual market. They will not be allowed to do that anymore. In the exchange, the private insurance companies that, that operate in the exchange cannot say no to anybody. They have to take everybody. They also have to renew health insurance. So you renew your health insurance once a year. They can't say, oh, you had a heart attack in the last year, we're not offering you an, a, new, a new insurance plan. Rating rules, what does that mean, that term rating rules? Right now, it's how insurance companies decide how much to charge you for your health insurance. And right now, the way it works, is that they can charge differently for men and women. And there was actually a study done recently that looked at Differences between men and women, and why do women pay more for their health insurance? Because people always say it's because women use the health care more than men, because men don't like to go to the doctor, and women get pregnant. And that's why they're more expensive, and that's why they get charged more. This study actually accounted for those two factors and looked at costs. Women in Missouri still pay, even if you take out pregnancy and more use of the healthcare system, still pay on average 150% more than men, just because you're a woman. You can also rate people differently for age. So a 60 year old versus a 20 year old right now, six year old pays eight, nine, 10 times as much as that younger person just because of their age. It has nothing to do with health status. They also can rate on health status. So if you have pre-existing conditions, you're gonna get charged a whole lot more. They can also rate you on occupation. If you work in mining, agriculture, <coughs> forestry, if you work in any high risk industries, you're gonna pay more for your health insurance. So how does that all change under this health insurance exchange? They can't rate you on gender. They can't rate you on health status. They can rate you on age. But it's instead of it being like eight to one, it can only be three to one. So older people can pay up to three times as much as a younger person. What does that do? And I'm in a room with a lot of young people, so I may get booed at this point. But right now, the way health insurance works based on age is it's a very steep line. The younger you are, the cheaper your health insurance is. As you get older, you're paying more and more and more year after year. What this law does is flatten out that curve. And you'll notice what my hand just did. Yeah, older people are gonna pay less and younger people are gonna pay more. It spreads out the risk, it makes a pool of people and it spreads out the costs among everybody. So yes, younger people will be paying more, older people will be paying less. Hopefully we all reach the age where we will benefit from being able to pay less. So they will be able to rate on age, they can rate on family size. If you're a family of five versus a family of two, you'll be able to pay more. And then if you are a tobacco user, you can pay one and a half times as much as a non-tobacco user. But that's all they can rate on. They can't rate on health status, they can't rate on occupation, they can't rate on gender. What does the benefit package very quickly in the exchange look like? So there is something in the exchange called an essential health benefit package. And if you go back to that farmer's market analogy, if you think about what's offered at each stall in the farmer's market, these are the things that have to be offered in every stall. Preventative care, hospitalization, ER, prescription drugs are in there, maternity care, mental health and substance abuse at parity with physical health. Um, and I didn't put it in here and there's a, there's a bigger list than this, but dental and vision for kids is part of the essential health benefit package. It is not in there for adults, but it is in there for kids. Now the interesting thing is that insurance companies can offer extras beyond this essential health benefit package to try to get you to pick their insurance. So they could offer vision or dental for adults if they were trying to entice people to pick their plan. Some of the other benefit features, no cost sharing on preventative care, so you go in for your wellness check, your immunizations, they don't charge you a copay. No annual or lifetime dollar limits on coverage and kids can stay on their parents' plan until age 26. Now some of you are saying to yourself, wait a second, some of this has kicked in already. And you would be correct. But right now we're talking about the insurance exchanges. We will get to the private insurance market separate from the exchanges in a couple of slides. So. 
I, one of the good things I said about the exchange was that it pooled all the people together, spreads out the costs. The other really interesting thing about the exchange is that any insurance company that wants to be part of the exchange, and the estimate is that in Missouri, up to 800,000 Missourians may use this exchange. 800,000. So I get asked, well, are insurance companies really going to participate? There's the prospect of 800,000 new customers. You betcha they're going to participate. Um, if they participate, they have to participate statewide. Why is that a big deal? Coming from St. Louis, it eh, doesn't mean a whole lot to us. We already have four or five insurance companies competing against each other. But I travel the whole state, and there are parts of Missouri where there is one insurance company that operates in that town. That is not competition. That insurance company tells employers, this is what we're charging you, take it or leave it. In the exchange, there will be competition. So if, even if there's three or four insurance companies that want to play in this ex insurance exchange, they have to play statewide which makes a huge difference to rural Missouri. So you go into the exchange as an individual or a family, and there is something called sub premium subsidies. So you go in, and I'm not going to get too into this, you go in and based on your income, the federal government will pay for part of your insurance premium. So if you think about going into the exchange, you go into the farmer's market. Sorry, I'm going to use this analogy to death. I promise I'll stop in a little bit. Um, you go into the farmer's market, and with you going into the market, on one side is what is called a patient navigator. So there is money in the Affordable Care Act to, to create these patient navigators that walk with you into looking at your options in the exchange. What's the best option for me? Which is the best plan? On the other side, you can think about having the federal government with you. So you finally find the, the plan you want and you go to pay that insurance company and you pay your premium every month. And when you pay your part of the premium, the federal government puts their part of the premium with you every month. So it's not something you're out of pocket for the whole year and then you get reimbursed. They're paying at the same time as you every month. They will reconcile those premium subsidies on your taxes. It's a sliding scale premium subsidy. I'm not going to get into this too much. But I will take questions if anybody does. Um, the next two slides I'm also going to sort of breeze through. There is a lot of incentives for small businesses to start offering health insurance. But one misconception that we hear a lot is that there is a fine or penalty if small businesses choose not to offer insurance, and that is not true. If you have less than 50 full-time equivalent employees, then there is no fine or penalty if you say, you know what, I don't want to deal with health insurance, it's too much of a headache. Now there are some incentives in forms of tax credits to try to get you to use our offer insurance, um, but there is no penalty if you don't. That is not true if you have more than 50 full-time employees, and this gets pretty complicated, and I'm not going to get into it, but what it is actually tied to is if you don't offer insurance and you have an employee that goes and uses that exchange and they get a subsidy in that exchange, you could be penalized as an employer. And in fact, even if as an employer you offer insurance, but it's really, really expensive insurance, and one of your employees says no, and they go into the exchange and they get that subsidy, you could also be fined in that way. I'm not going to dig into it any deeper unless people have questions at the end. Um, I do want to quickly point out this last one. Um, for two years now, this has been delayed. On your W-2, so if you work, you get a W-2 from your employer. On your W-2, there is a new requirement in the Affordable Care Act that says your employer will put on there how much your health insurance costs, how much they pay, and how much you pay. Now, I've had a couple employers get a little feisty about that. Um, and some people think it's the first step towards starting to tax health benefits. And I will tell you that was not the intention, although I can't promise that's not where we're going. Um, the intention of putting that on the W-2 was one, transparency. So a lot of people, a lot of employees have no idea how expensive health insurance is. And so it's to give people some idea of how much health insurance really costs. The other thing is that you turn your, your W-2s in on your taxes. And who is paying attention to whether you have health insurance and meet that individual mandate? The IRS. So if it's on your W-2, there's nothing else that you need to do. You just prove to the IRS that you have health insurance. So it really was to make it simpler to prove that you have health insurance for purposes of the individual mandate. 
So we talked about private insurance within the exchange, but private insurance will still exist outside of the exchange. In fact, a lot of large employers will just keep using the insurance they have if they're happy with it. But there are some new rules relating to private insurance, and some of these have already kicked in. So no annual or lifetime limits go away. So the, annual, the lifetime limits have already gone away. The annual limits will go away in 2014. No pre-existing condition exclusions. 2014, that kicks in. You can't deny people health insurance because of pre-existing conditions. It kicks in in 2014 for adults. It actually already kicked in for kids. And we have had problems with the insurance market for kids because of this. So one of the negatives, I said I will point out positives and negatives, um, is that, we, that that sort of screwed up the insurance market for, for kid-only plans. In fact, Missouri, most insurance companies in Missouri don't offer children-only plans anymore because of this pre-existing condition exclusion. Those rating rules I talked about earlier, in the exchange, same rating rules in private insurance. That kicks in 2014, guaranteed issue, 2014. Dependents up to age 26 kicked in in 2010, September 23rd, 2010. Um, about 500,000 young people have gained insurance and about three million total have been able to stay on their parents' insurance because of this one provision. And that's part of the reason why we saw a drop in the number of uninsured in the most recent census numbers that came out last week. Well, uh, I want to just briefly talk about if you've heard of this medical loss ratio, this MLR, what does that mean? So right now, you pay your premiums. You pay for your health insurance. You pay a premium every month or out of every paycheck. How much of that money that insurance companies collect from you actually goes towards providing medical care for you as the purchaser of that plan? So if you look at Medicare and Medicaid, which are government programs, they spend about 6% on overhead on administrative costs. We do have some nonprofit health insurance companies left in this country. On average, they spend between 7 and 10% on overhead. For for-profit health insurance companies, there is a huge range. So some for-profits spend on the really low range of 10% on overhead. Unfortunately, it goes all the way up to 40% being spent of your premium dollars on things like advertising and marketing, administrative costs, profit, executive salaries. So there's this new rule called the MLR and it actually just kicked in. It kicked in in 2011 and applied in 2012. And it says insurance companies in the large group market have to spend 85% of your premium dollars on providing health care for you. Um, and if they don't, they have to issue a refund check for the difference. In Missouri, these refund checks were due on August 1st, 2012 for the 2011 insurance year. Um, Missourians received about $65 million in rebates from insurance companies. So the foundation, where we have 42 employees, um, we got a rebate check in the amount of $12,000. So this applies to both businesses and individuals and families. In Missouri, we call Medicaid MoHealthNet, and I want to talk a little about this. So what the ACA originally said was that Medicaid or MoHealthNet would be expanded to 133% of poverty for all non-Medicare individuals and families. There would also be a guaranteed benchmark benefit package, very similar to that essential health benefit package. Initially, for the first three years, this expanded population in Medicaid would be 100% federally financed, and then it would step down 95%, 94, 93. By 2020, it would be at 90% federally financed with a 10% state match. What does that mean for Missouri? So across the bottom are the eligibility categories in Medicaid. Missouri for children is this first bar. We are one of the most generous states when it comes to Medicaid eligibility for kids. We cover kids and families up to 300% of poverty. Now there are premiums for those higher income kids. On the flip side, we're one of the top five most generous states when it comes to kids. On the flip side, and this is actually slightly wrong, we cover parents up to about 18% of poverty. And that, why is that wrong? Because when we changed eligibility for parents here in Missouri in 2005, we tied it to the absolute federal minimum, which is actually a dollar amount from 1996. 
It's tied to our old aid for families with dependent children, which was welfare, which doesn't even exist anymore. It's now TANF. But it's tied to a dollar amount that is not adjusted upwards. So if you are a parent in Missouri, so say you're a single mom with two kids, in order for you to be eligible for Medicaid in the state of Missouri, you have to, family of three, you have to make less than $3,500 per year. Per year. So we saw over 100,000 parents fall off of Medicaid when that happened. Pregnant women were a little bit above the federal minimum. We're at 185% of poverty. Individuals who are blind or right at the poverty level, elderly and disabled at 85% of poverty. Currently, we do not have a category for childless adults. So if you don't have any dependent children, you're not elderly, disabled, or blind, or pregnant, then you are not eligible for Medicaid regardless of how much money you make. And there are only a handful of states that have any coverage in childless adults. So under health reform, if we would expand Medicaid, it would expand parents up to 133% of poverty, and it would create a brand new category for childless adults. Now I keep saying percentage of poverty level, what does that mean? So you can see, and I threw in 133% of poverty so you could tell what we were talking about, and it's based on family size. So a family of four, for parent eligibility would be expanded up to about 30,000 a year. These are not excessive incomes, um, that, but I wanted you to see what does 133% of poverty look like. At the bottom you can see those are the dollar amounts for parent eligibility currently in the state of Missouri, and they don't change year to year. They're, they've been the exact same since 2005. So why is this important? And I didn't touch on this when we were talking about if you'll remember those premium subsidies I was talking about in the exchange, so you aren't eligible for a premium subsidy. You're eligible for a premium subsidy if you're between 100% of poverty and 400% of poverty. If you're below 100% of poverty, you aren't eligible for any subsidies in the exchange. If we expand Medicaid, it's this yellow part. So the green is current eligibility for parents. This is Medicaid expansion. Because of the Supreme Court ruling, Medicaid expansion is now optional. So states can either do it or not do it, and it's up to them. Why is that a problem? And if we'll go back to that question of severability, and why did the minority opinion of the Supreme Court throughout the entire law, this is part of it. Because every component of the Affordable Care Act sort of builds on other components. And the problem is, if you take out Medicaid expansion, and you don't do it, what happens? You still have this exchange and you have subsidies and people can find affordable insurance here. But the part of this graph that is just plain yellow, those individuals wouldn't be able to have Medicaid and they wouldn't be able to have a subsidy in the exchange. Which means we're creating this donut hole of the uninsured in our state. Now, why is that a huge problem for both businesses and hospitals and healthcare systems? Because another part of the Affordable Care Act, right now there's a whole lot of different funding streams that help hospitals pay for caring for the uninsured. The Affordable Care Act said, well, if we're gonna cover 32 million Americans with health insurance, we don't need all that money for the uninsured. So guess what's being cut? a lot of those funding streams for the uninsured. So if you ever heard of Medicare dish funds, Medicaid dish funds, there's huge cuts coming. So there's not gonna be the money for hospitals to care for the uninsured, but they're still mandated to care for the uninsured when they walk in the door. So it puts us in a bind of we're gonna, if we don't do Medicaid expansion, we're gonna have a huge pool of uninsured left but we're not gonna have any money coming in or very less money coming in to care for the uninsured. And businesses should care because hospitals, in order to survive, are gonna to have to shift some of those costs onto somebody else. And the only people hospitals can negotiate with is private insurance companies who are just gonna shift the costs onto the people that are buying their insurance product. So businesses are gonna see their prices go up. So I point this out, one, because Medicaid expansion is, become a, is gonna be an issue in our legislative session that starts in January, and two, of how this will impact you as providers. Um, your hospital systems are thinking about this, trust me. So uh, impact, so that was Medicaid, Medicare, very quickly. Um, there are some Medicaid-related, Medicare-related provisions, and I wanted to touch on these. 
because there's been a lot in the presidential campaign about Medicare. Um, there is actually new spending for Medicare in the Affordable Care Act, and there are cuts to Medicare or changes. Now, the reduction in Medicare spending is meant to improve efficiency and improve the delivery of care. Very quickly, the new money in Medicare. About, there's about $105 billion over the next 10 years of new money going into Medicare. About $43 billion is to close the Part D prescription drug benefit donut hole. And my next slide covers that. About $38 billion to reduce premiums for very low income Medicare recipients. $5 billion for preventative benefits, and some of these have kicked in. So Medicare patients can go to the doctor and pay no copay for preventative services. They can receive a health risk assessment and a personalized prevention plan from their physician, and their physician will get reimbursed for that service, those services. And there are incentives for them to complete behavior modification programs. That sounds really scary, behavior mod, but that's quit smoking and lose weight. Um, and then finally, there is $8 billion in there to bump up the rates for primary care docs um, that take Medicare patients. And the reason they put this in there is unfortunately, most people are aware Medicaid reimburses really bad, really low. Um, and so we have problems with doctors accepting Medicaid patients because they're not reimbursed enough to even cover costs. Unfortunately, what we're starting to see is that physicians are even starting to be reluctant to take new Medicare patients which is troublesome because we're, the baby boomers are starting to retire and we're gonna see the Medicare population like double. Um, so they wanted to encourage doctors to take, continue to take Medicare patients, so they bumped up their rate. Now this is one of the things that I think is a negative. Um, it's a great idea. The problem is this is only a two year bump up and then it goes away. So it's, to me, it feels sort of tricky. Like, okay, we're gonna bump up your rate so you keep taking Medicare patients, and then after two years, we're gonna drop your rate back down. And I get that it was an issue of money, um, but it seems a little disingenuous. The donut hole, um, very quickly, Part D in Medicare is your prescription drug coverage. Currently, this is the way it works. You pay a deductible, once your deductible is paid, the plan, the insurance plan pays 75%, you pay 25%. Once you hit about 2,800 in prescription drug spending every year, you hit what is called the donut hole, which is this big green box. Um, you are responsible for 100% of your prescription drug costs when you hit that. About 8 million Medicare recipients hit that donut hole every year. You are responsible for 100% until you get to catastrophic coverage at $6,500. By 2020, this is a slow phase in. By 2020, that donut hole will be gone and the costs will be split 75-25 um, until you reach catastrophic and then it's 95-5. Savings to Medicare. Um, this is also a couple of things are, don't make sense to me. Um, provider payments, there are some cuts to provider payments. I'm just gonna put it out there. Um, some of those are those dish funds that I was talking about the Medicare and Medicaid dish funds that are being cut that pay, help pay for the uninsured. There is cuts to home health. Um, those don't make a lot of sense to me. We're trying to keep, keep people out of nursing homes, keep them in their home. Home health is one of the ways that, that allows that, and, but they're cutting rates to home health providers. There are rate cuts to Medicare Advantage. What is Medicare Advantage? It's Part C. It's the private insurance companies that offer Medicare. Why are they cutting Medicare Advantage? So Medicare Advantage has been around a long time, and originally the private insurance companies came to Medicare, or to Congress, and they said, we can do Medicare, and we can do it for a lot cheaper than the government. So where are we now? Medicare Advantage plans, on average, cost us 14% more than if people, everybody was just in Medicare fee-for-service. So this cut to Medicare Advantage is actually cutting those plans 14%. So they're at the same level with fee-for-service. There also is some increases in income-related premiums, so higher income people, more than 250,000 for a couple, will see their Medicare premiums increase slightly. Um, there is this new independent payment advisory panel. If you've heard the rumor about death panels, that's where this comes from. Um, the way the independent payment advisory panel works is that it's a panel of experts appointed by the president. They make recommendations about efficiency and saving money in Medicare. 
In the past, there is a, a, a current payment advisory panel, but Congress has to approve their recommendations by a vote, and it doesn't happen all that often. They, they do approve some stuff. This new panel, Congress still has power, but instead of voting for something to go into effect with Medicare, they have to vote for something not to go into effect. So it does give the panel a little bit more power, but if you hear about the death panels and president appointed experts deciding whether grandma lives or dies, this is where this comes from, um, is that end of, and this may go away. There's a lot of pressure for that to be repealed. Um, there's a lot of hospitals legitimately sort of freaking out about hospital readmissions. Um, if you've heard about this, if someone is in Medicare and they get admitted to the hospital and they are readmitted in the hospital within 30 days for that same condition, the hospital has to treat them and it doesn't get paid. So the big question is, it sounds good in theory, sort of, you know, if the hospital doesn't provide high quality care, they discharge people too soon, they shouldn't get paid if they come back. The problem is, what does that mean? Does that mean that hospitals are now responsible to make sure people have transportation to their follow-up appointments? To make sure they're filling their prescription drug? That you, you know, the hospital gave them a, a script? Do you have to make sure they fill it? What is that, how much responsibility do the hospitals have? And on, it seems like a lot of responsibility. So I know in St. Louis, BJC, Barnes Jewish Hospital is, actually has already piloted a program targeted at their Medicare clients in the hospital, and they have caseworkers that are following these people for 30 days after coverage, after discharge, to make sure they get to appointments, fill their prescription drugs, do everything they need to do to try to keep them out of the hospital. And this is legitimately a huge concern for hospitals. The individual mandate, just very quickly, and we're gonna run out of time. Um, what the individual mandate says is that starting in 2014, you have to have insurance. Um, if you don't, in 2014, the penalty is either $95 or 1% of your taxable income. It slowly phases in. By 2016, it's 2% of your taxable income or 2.5% or of your taxable income or 700 bucks. There are exemptions for financial hardship, religious objections, or if you cannot find health insurance that costs less than 8% of your family's income, you can be exempted from the individual mandate. Um, very quickly, workforce. So one of the big concerns with the Affordable Care Act, expanding coverage, health insurance coverage, to 32 million new Americans. That's great, 32 million more Americans will have a health insurance card. But just because you have insurance doesn't mean you have access to care. We already have huge workforce shortages in this country. There is some little things being done in the Affordable Care Act to address workforce, but not enough. Th this has to be addressed, and I think it's something that is going to need to be addressed at a state-by-state -state level. So this is gonna have to be a big conversation in Missouri. How do we address these workforce shortages? We already had them. Now we're gonna see a lot of people that have that insurance card, where are they gonna go for care? Um, there is a, this, there, this is mostly grant programs to medical schools. There is a grant program specifically for states. Missouri did apply. It didn't get funded in the first round, um, but there will be other rounds for that. A couple of highlights of quality. There is a new, in Medicare, there will be a phys physician compare website where consumers can go to compare physicians. There will be financial rewards for hospitals based on quality and patient outcomes. Those Medicare Advantage plans can get a five, even though they're being cut 14%, they can also get a 5% bonus if they rate four or five stars on quality ratings. I already touched on that independent payment advisory panel. And then there's something that's being called PCORI, Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute. It's comparative effectiveness research. Um, they make recommendations. These are not mandated, they will not be mandated recommendations. They will just be sort of information research put out there for physicians and health professionals to use. Very quickly, um, new models of care, they're coming. Um, I just heard the other day a really good analogy of you're standing on a dock, the dock's okay, you know, it holds you, but it's starting to wear and tear and there's a really nice brand new boat and you sort of have one foot in the boat and one foot on the dock. 
and you can't decide. Do you really want to float off in the boat or do you want to take your chances staying with the, the dock? You can think of the dock as the fee-for-service system and the boat is pay for performance, accountable care organizations, patient-centered medical homes. We are moving away from the fee-for-service system and hospital systems, healthcare systems have to decide what are they going to do because the boat's starting to move and people's legs are being stretched. Are we going to stick with fee-for-service and try to make, continue with that model and make it work or are we going to get on board with a lot of the new models that are coming? Now, the government only has control really over Medicare and Medicaid, so a lot of these new models are being tested with those two types of insurance and it's mostly Medicare. Things like patient-centered medical homes, which Missouri was actually first in the nation at getting a Medicaid waiver to do patient-centered medical homes. Um, this idea of accountable care organizations, bundled payments, global payments, and there is a new Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation that will be testing some of these um, new reform models. Where are we moving? Very quickly, this graph looks really scary. Over here is payment bundling. This is how we organize physicians and health professionals. And then the other side is performance. And we are moving away from small, unrelated practices. We are moving towards fully integrated delivery systems. Because when you move in that direction to the right, you're able to do things like global payment, outcome measures as a, as a percentage of total payment. It's really hard to do these type of payment models with small unrelated hospitals. So there is gonna be a lot of pressure into the future to start moving towards integrated health systems. Okay, I just ran out of time for questions, but I will stick around. This is our website, uh, covermissouri.org. All of the information that's out on the table is also on this website. Um, and please feel free to follow up with questions or uh, Comments. If you have questions, we're glad to pass the mic around the room. Anybody have a question? Yeah. Any questions? If not, I'll let Ann Ryan answer the questions that did come through. Uh, but first, I would like everybody to have a chance to thank Ryan for being with us today. We also want to thank uh, the Missouri Foundation for Health for allowing Ryan to be here and for providing the refreshments and to ATSU for allowing us the location and um, Corey especially for his AV work and live streaming the event for us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for Medicare and Medicaid report that only 3% of those on Medicare are getting the annual wellness visit, now being reimbursed. Are there, is there, any, are there any informed opinions about why the number is so low? And I really think that has to do with people not knowing that that is an available service that they can get without any uh, copay. There was a question from the audience about um, the ACA just decreasing federal support for graduate medical education. Um, there's actually increases and decreases and it's really complicated and too complicated to answer in 20 seconds. Um, but there is, an in, there is some increased funding to try to improve workforce in that. And this is similar to the, the wellness check, so I will go ahead and end there. Thank you guys.